Hi, I'm Tanner Olson, and this is episode eight of Walk a Little Slower, a podcast where I share a little hope, a little love, and a little bit of what I've been learning. This is a podcast where you are invited to slow down, to lean in, to hold fast, and to eventually keep going. Welcome. Before we get into today's episode, I wanted to take a moment to say thank you for being here. Thank you for listening and for sharing this podcast with your friends and your online community. And if you haven't yet left a review, please do. Like this review from Britt Thor. She said this on Apple Podcasts. Tanner's words are full of humble wisdom and the truths we tend to forget. If you need a safe place or a routine that helps you reset in life, you found it. I really do hope that this podcast is a safe place, a place where we can remember the truth together, where we can wrestle with questions, and maybe we can even disagree on a few things from time to time. So if you haven't yet left a review or rating, please do. Today, I'll be sharing a story, I'll be sharing a poem, and I'll be sharing a conversation with my friend and fellow writer, Kyle G. Jones. We talk about haikus. Anyways, here is episode eight of Walk a Little Slower. Give it time. This has been my mantra of sorts for the last few years. I've put these words on shirts and stickers, written them into poems, and have whispered them to myself when I try to jump ahead and I am always trying to jump ahead. Give it time. It's the advice I share with young artists and creatives, words that I wish I had told myself years before. These three words are echoed by creation. The trees groan them and the flowers, they sing them. And my mom said something like this years ago. And I wanna tell you that story. The following is the introduction to my first book, I'm All Over the Place, a book of poems, prayers, and wonderings. And if you haven't grabbed a copy yet, well, you are in luck. It's available on my website, writtentospeak.com, or on Amazon. It's a yellow book with a pickup truck, and to this day, I'm still incredibly proud of these words. And this is the introduction. The summer between third and fourth grade, I woke up each morning to watch Space Jam on our oversized box-shaped television in the living room. I popped the tape into the VCR and for the next 100 minutes, I watched Michael Jordan and the Looney Tunes take on the Monstars from Moron Mountain. With a basketball in my hands, I'd mimic every move as I sang off key to I Believe I Can Fly. For a moment, I believed I could. After Michael Jordan jumped from the free throw line, dunking to defeat the Monstars and win back his friend's talents, spoiler alert, I know, I'd put on my Nikes and shoot hoops beneath the blazing Florida sun until it disappeared for the night. There was no question in my mind that I was going to be like Mike. I felt most alive with a basketball in my hands. On the basketball court, there was this unshakable freedom, a collision of beauty and wholeness that held opportunity for something magical to take place. Basketball is like a blank page as it anticipates a story to be written, a place where anything could become. In middle school, I stood at the free throw line with less than a second left on the game clock. The game was tied, and I needed to make one free throw for us to win the game. Nerves swarmed in my stomach like an army of angry bees as I felt every pair of eyes on me, even the cute cheerleaders, especially the cute cheerleaders. The referee bounced the ball to me as I began to channel my inner Michael Jordan. Sweat dripped from my forehead as I tried to slow myself down, taking a deep breath, exhaling nerves. I dreamed of hitting this shot thousands of times, practicing it daily in our front yard. I bounced the ball three times before spinning it in my hands, just like Michael. As the ball spun on my fingers, I could feel every raised ridge of the leather. Before I bounced the ball again, I heard my mom exclaim from the bleachers, take your time. Thanks, mom. Even if it was the wrong time, this is what I needed to hear. And recently, I've been needing to hear the things I know to be true. 
I was in middle school 15 years ago, and soon after stepping foot into high school did my dream of becoming a professional basketball player walk out the other side. Setbacks, surgeries, and, well, topping out at 5 foot 10 helped bring this dream to its unfortunate end. When you let go of a dream, something inside of you dies. And with mourning comes questions and uncertainty. With setback comes questions and uncertainty. And with questions and uncertainty come lies. Fake truths begin to blend themselves into our thinking, infiltrating our lives, and we slowly come to believe them. That we aren't enough, or worthy, or capable. That we don't matter. And no one will miss us if, well, if we're gone. I've come to learn the truth is easier to believe when all is fine. But once struggle or setback enters the picture, lies become louder and the truth becomes difficult to believe or remember or, or hold on to. We begin to distance ourselves from the truth we believe and instead draw closer to the lies, to the great fear welling within. And fear does a wonderful job of silencing the truth. And when the truth is silenced, questions begin to weigh heavy. And uncertainty begins to cloud certainty. And doubt places distance between who I am and who I want to become. And that's why I started writing. A blank page became my basketball court. A place where I came alive, writing myself back to life. With a pen in my hand, I began to see the truth deep within, scribbling myself back to life. I was able to find beauty in the mundane, coming alive like I did on the basketball court. I learned how to wrestle with the noise and how to seek the silence, to fight the constant chaos and learn how to, how to take my time. In my head, I'm, I'm all over the place. But writing kept me from going over the edge, from scribbling the final goodbye. Writing has reminded me this is all worth living for, the same reminder that basketball gave me. The same freedom I found in basketball, I found in writing. Day after day and page after page, I found myself searching and sifting through thoughts, questions, and wonderings. And that's exactly what this book is full of. Poems, prayers, and wonderings. I hope you enjoy it. And always remember, Give it time. I'm excited to share with you my interview with Kyle G. Jones. I'm not going to waste any more time. Let's just hop right into this conversation. I I never know how to start an interview. You know? I do. So so you you know how to start an interview? No, I do know what you how you feel (laughs) about not being able to start an interview. Maybe I should start the interview like this. I'm here with longtime Miami Heat fan, Kyle Jones. Kyle, how's it going today? It's going all right. It's been a hard week for the Heat, but you know, God exists and he is good. So, God exists and he is good. I love that. Kyle, what would you like for us to know about you? Yes. So I'm a husband and a father to one of both, one wife and one daughter. It always feels weird to like say like give all that extra information, but you know, don't want to give anybody the wrong impression. Um, but I'm also a director of faith formation for a church in Brookfield, Wisconsin, Calvary Lutheran Church. And I suppose I would fancy myself with some proof and evidence, a writer and an author, and then maybe a poet, since this is a slow it down poetry podcast. I, I would say that you most certainly are a poet. Um, I know that I have really enjoyed reading your writing recently and also your your photos of food that you seem to be posting. I always like enjoy that because it reminds me of the simple days of the internet where someone's like, I made this for lunch. I love that. So thanks for doing that. Of course, of course. I mean, I've gotten into cooking even before the pandemic. And so it's kind of a, um, I live right next to the church that I work for. So my commute is a grand total of like three minutes if I'm walking slow. So like cooking for my family is kind of like my commute home, throw on a podcast or listen to some music. Mm -hmm. Um, You have an excuse to kind of say like, Hey, don't bother me because I'm cooking and things are hot and dangerous in here. And then you can kind of just like decompress from the day and, um, and then make food for your family, which I enjoy making. Uh, You mentioned that it's, it is important that you walk a little slower as you head back home, as you commute. So uh, thanks for that little plug. Uh, Why, 
Why do you write, Kyle? I think at this point, I write because I just can't help it. It's been a decent, maybe not a long journey in the grand scheme of my life, but I've been writing for a long time on a regular basis, I feel, since regularly on the internet since 2014. But I took journalism in high school as well as creative writing. I was on the newspaper staff. I was on yearbook. Um, And so I just, I enjoy writing because it helps me to kind of say what I know, but also know what I'm saying. Mm. And the other thing that it's done for me now, especially, is it helps me to slow down enough to notice what's around me. And I don't mean just like in a physical sense, but like where my headspace is, um, what I'm reading, um, what I, what God is saying to me through scripture and my conversations with others and prayer and writing is just one of those things that helps, I think for many people as well, solidify kind of what's going on because things can move so fast. I can just get up in the morning, do my routine. Um, and if I really want to be lazy, throw on like sports center or get up and, just pay attention to that kind of, but really, you know, kind of be looking on my phone most of the yeah. time until they say something semi-interesting that I want to hear. And then, um, and then it's, oh, shoot, I should have been dressed already. So now I got to rush to do that and then take my three minute commute run to the office and try to figure out how I'm going to start the day. Um, writing really says like, hey, you know, you got to like slow down and think about this, um, especially the editing process of writing. It really says like, well, what did I really mean to say? Did I say it right? Did I say it well? Am I communicating this? Um, and so that's what it really does for me. Yeah. And I love the thing with with poetry is, is how can I say this with less words? So I can be quite direct and honest with what I'm saying instead of adding, not necessarily fluff, but with poetry, you're, you're basically like cutting the fat and saying, here's just the meat. And that's mm-hmm. one of the things that I enjoy with some poetry, I guess you can say. Um, how does writing impact your relationship with God? A lot of the writing that I do for like 1517.org for their online blog, um, the book that I co-authored with my friend, uh, Kathy, we, it's the Sinner St. Lenten devotional. Um, that's, I mean, that's kind of like God focused. So that's like taking like things that God is, um, given us to teach or things that God, ha- that Kathy and I, when we're working on devotionals and stuff like that. Um, how can we communicate the truth of the gospel? Um, so it certainly works out that way. But what it's what's been happening for me lately as I've moved and try to figure out exactly like what kind of poetry maybe do I want to write on a regular basis um, is it's helped me to appreciate uh, how do I want to say it? It would help me appreciate um, the the kind of the ordinary or the mundane. Um, the poetry that I've been really into writing and want to continue to write is haiku poetry, which many people maybe know. Um, you know, it's three lines and five, seven, five. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit, I suppose, because I want to educate as well, because there's some things I didn't know about haiku. But what <laughs> one of the things about haiku or the presumption or the what it's kind of its premise is that it's um, sees the profound and what's most ordinary. So it's not trying to like grab something from the ephemeral or the ethereal and like bring it down to earth. It's like, Hey, this moment in time is worth remembering because I noticed it because I was here because I was, because I saw it. Um, and that's one of the things I think that God does for us as he works through the ordinary and the mundane. I think Paul says it in first Corinthians either chapter one or two, where he's talking about how God uses the ordinary um, in one sense, like he uses the foolish to shame the wise and he uses um, the weak to shame the strong. And so God is always using the things that seem most ordinary, like water and bread and wine and spoken words um, to communicate his truth and to deliver the gospel to us. And um, haiku poetry for me does that. It like slows me down. And it's like, oh, hey, I noticed this little thing that seems <laughs> boring or like, so what? Yeah. Um, but, and fills it with, uh, more meaning. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, would you go ahead and share a a poem or two with us? Yes. So I'm going to share, um, a couple of haiku, but I want to at least make a a comment on haiku itself because, 
Um, haiku, um, most people know it as, you know, a short poem of Japanese origin that has roughly 17 syllables um, in a 5-7-5 five, pattern. So like five syllables in the first, seven in the second, five in the third. Um, unfortunately, most of our English teachers, when we have to love them, because they do a lot of work for us to teach us important things, um, and they don't have time to di- dig into all of the minutiae of every little bit of style and genre of poetry. But that's like probably the least. Um, I don't wanna, how do I want to say this kindly? This is probably that's probably the least uh, f- centric uh, thing. How do I want to say this? I'm trying to figure it out the best way to say it. That's just that's not the essence of haiku poetry. Like haiku is not like squeezing your thoughts into a strict five seven five format, um, right. and that co- like that idea of five seven five kind of comes out of its origins. But fi- uh, seventeen syllables in English are not the same as seventeen sounds um, mm-hmm. or breath sounds in Japanese. So like it doesn't like translate in the same way. But what haiku is is it's noticing that moment. Um, And using simple and concrete direct language to communicate something objective that people can see. So using your senses um, to communicate a feeling, but without telling people what that feeling is. You know what I mean? Yeah, that makes sense. Like it's not trying to make a point. It's trying to make a feeling. Right. And it's not like trying to shove words into a box so that it fits this 575, right? It's like it's you're just Mm -hmm. trying to create something that is held in that right because i yes. think when, I, when people try to write haikus they're like well it has to be like this this and this and it's like well it yeah but it, it's more of like it, it's the have to versus get to you know yes and that was very freeing for me the strict this idea of a strict five seven five because it kind of like put limits as l- many limits do create creativity mm-hmm. but the limits for haiku are how you're saying what you're saying um and Haiku is not nature poetry, which is a lot. The other poetry that I write is very much focused on nature, I suppose, because just the winter in Wisconsin is very um, oppressive, <laughs> to put it kindly, as you know. Yes. Um, and so it kind of just encompasses a lot of large portion of your life when you're going through it. But uh, um, haiku attempts to um, notice things in nature and in human life. And so it can be roughly about anything, but one of the goals of haiku is to kind of give people a sense of like when and where something is happening at the same time. So I'll read, I have three that I think that will do that will, and maybe a bonus one, um, that I think can kind of show what's going on a bit. And these are the ones that uh, I've written myself. The first one goes like this face flush looking down to avoid another, slipping on ice. Nice. I like that. An open, yeah, I like, uh, that one was fun, but I also, you know, I've slipped on the ice a few times and, you know, you look up and around and you're like, I hope nobody, I hope nobody saw that. That's pretty embarrassing. All right, you just keep reading them and then when you're done, you tell me that you're done. I don't want to interrupt the flow anymore. No, it's all good. (laughs) It's all good. I always, I'm never quite sure exactly how to read haiku. I've tried to look it up. Like, what's the best way? Do I read it twice? Do I just read it once? Um, (laughs) So I'm just going to read them once. And then if, dear listener, if you want to hit pause and go back, you certainly can. Or you could just blow past it. (laughs) It's up to you. Not every haiku is not, (laughs) haiku is not for everybody. Back or the 15 second ahead. Either way, it's 15. Yeah, haiku is not for everybody, and not offended if you don't get it or you don't want to get it. It's all good. So here is uh, here are a few more. An open door, a light shines on desire, a midnight snack, dandelions, cut down on the field of battle by the mower. And here's the last one that I'll share, and we can wrap this up here. The bathroom. A fan in the dark. Wrong switch. I don't know how, but that that last one just gave me chills. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure why, but that was, those are really good. And I'm not just saying that because we're talking, um, <laughs> but I, I really enjoyed those. I re- can you read can you read the second one one more time? Yes, about yes. the refrigerator I'm assuming. Yes, yes. So um 
just a little bit uh, for anybody who wants to jump into haiku a bit more before we make this interview too long and your slowing down po- your podcast about slowing down ends up being too long. Um, so there's a, a website or an organization run by a haiku poet named Michael Dylan Welch. Um, it's called National Haiku Writing Month. Um, so you just type that into Google and it'll show up. It'll be the first thing. Um, they have a Facebook group. Um, and while National Haiku Writing Month is actually February, they do their Facebook page group does writing prompts like every day. Mm-hmm. So um, that's a super helpful way to just be like thinking about like, how can I notice something? And one of the prompts was desire um, for that. And this is sometimes haiku, as you know, or poetry in general writes itself. And so this is um, a haiku about desire. An open door. A light shines on desire. A midnight snack. I just think that's so good. And I, and I think that's one of the, I think that illustrates pretty well the beauty of poetry, right? Is it just kind of, it, it slowly reveals more for the reader and even mm-hmm. for the writer as well. And like you need, you need the first line as much as you need the last line, but the last line often doesn't make sense without the first line. Right. Yes. And yeah, maybe no, that's totally just, that's it's, I mean, pretty obvious, but I, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe for, you know, believers, followers of Jesus, like we need, we need what happened in the beginning so that we can help better understand the end. And, um, yeah, well, let's just leave it at that. Kyle, before you, before you go, first of all, thank you for, for sharing poetry with us. Those are really good. Uh, where can, where can people find your work? Yes. So, um, I have, uh, you can go to Kyle G Jones dot substack.com. It's where I try to post, um, all, all my poetry that I share in public is generally there. Um, it's under the blog titled uh, Pertinent Coordinates. Um, so I po- try to post there regularly. Um, if you forget all about that, you can uh, find me on Instagram and Twitter at Kyle George Jones. Um, and then if you're interested in anything that I do for 1517, you can just go to 1517.org, type my name into the search bar or look for me in the regular contributors file and you'll be able to see a majority of the stuff that I've written for 1517. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us on this episode of Walk a Little Slower. I really appreciate you, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Walk a Little Slower. If you have a question or a poem that you would like to submit, send it to written to speak at gmail.com. As always, you can find me online at written to speak on Instagram or at written to speak.com. If you'd like to support this podcast and my ministry, visit patreon.com slash written to speak to become a patron. Your monthly donations allow me to spread hope and announce love through written and spoken word like this podcast. To close out today's episode, I'd like to share a poem with you. It's titled Other, and it can be found on page 48 of I'm All Over the Place. Give it time. You'll make it to the other side, but for now, well, for now you are here, where uncertainty and questions and truth and dad jokes collide and live side by side, where everything is visible and out of sight, wild and calm here where there aren't enough cups of coffee or smiles or tacos, where seven billion of us stand together and alone beneath the sun and moon, storms and stars, but but give it time. You'll make it to the other side, and for now, come alive. Throw a pizza party, order a milkshake, order two milkshakes, order everyone a milkshake. Get lost within the beauty of daydreaming only to wake to chase them down. Listen, like every sentence is a secret in its third grade again, and they're asking, do you want to know who likes you? Check yes when you can, respond with kindness, replace hate with love, spread hope like Nutella, because we can never have enough of both. Search for answers with humility, live with palms face up, give grace to the dark places of your life, and when you dance, because you were made to dance, dance like no one is watching, and if they are, give them something to see. Seek a forever beyond the heavy chaos of living and evening traffic and grocery stores full of hard avocados and broken smiles. 
Find magic. And don't let it go. Embrace the weird. Protect passion. Meet peace in the escaping presence. And like Grandma said, count your blessings. And when you get to a million and one, don't be done, but start again. Hold on to compassion and curiosity as you step and stumble to where you are going. And when you stumble, get up and keep going. Keep going like it's going to be okay. Face fear, pray on bent and broken knees. Stand up and step again. And when you stand to step, step to stand up for what is right. Stand up against what is wrong. Stand up for those who have gone on. Pause in the presence of beauty and photograph the memory with your own. Risk everything, even if you're the only one who sees why. Chase a sunset and take a bite out of the cotton candy sky. Stay for tomorrow. Live with more love than yesterday. Walk with the weary and learn their songs and sing them with your soul. Write, speak, and live honest words of love. Shout a song of celebration and celebrate good news. Scream beneath the rain until your mouth fills with a sip and let that sip turn into a smile. Create art and nachos and sandcastles and share them with our world. Tell your story, the one that you're living, the one that is changing our world because you are changing our world. And watch. Watch it continue to spin and change. Invite others to join the change. Take root and hold each other up. Call patience close and push comparison far, far away. And be the awakened. Remain the awakened. Go north to south, east to west. Sit on a front porch and be. Just be. Be present. Give it time. And we will get to the other side.